Chapter 7 When nuclear fireballs crisped Orlando and the power plants serving Tumukuan County, refrigeration stopped, along with electric cooking. The oil furnaces, sparked by electricity, died. All radios were useless unless battery-powered or in automobiles. Washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, fryers, toasters, roasters, vacuum cleaners, shavers, heaters, beaters, all stopped. So did the electric clocks, vibrating chairs, electric blankets, irons for pressing clothes, curlers for hair. The electric pump stopped, and when the pump stopped, the water stopped, and when the water stopped, the bathrooms ceased functioning. Not until the second day after the day did Randy Bragg fully understand and accept the results of the loss of electricity. Temporary loss of power was nothing new in Fort Repose. Often during the equinoctial storms, poles and trees came down and power lines were severed. This condition rarely lasted for more than a day, for the repair trucks were out as soon as the wind abated and the roads became passable. It was hard to realize that this time the power plants themselves were gone. There could be no doubt of it. On Sunday and Sunday night, a number of survivors from Orlando's suburbs drove through Fort Repose, foraging for food and gasoline. They could not be positive of what had happened, except that the area of destruction extended for eight miles from the Orlando airport, encompassing College Park and Rollins College, and another explosion had centered on McCoy Air Force Base. The Orlando Conorad stations had warned of an air raid just before the explosions, so it was presumed that this attack had not come from submarine-based missiles or ICBMs, but from bombers. Randy did not hear Mrs. Van Brucker Brown again, or any further hard news or instructions on the Clear Channel stations on Sunday or Monday. He did hear WSMF announcing that it would be on the air at only two minutes each hour thereafter, since it was operating on auxiliary power. He knew that the hospital in San Marco possessed an auxiliary diesel generator. He concluded that this source of power was being tapped, each hour on the hour, to operate the radio station. Each hour, the County Conalrad station repeated warnings, boil all drinking water, do not drink fresh milk, do not use the telephone, and in the Sunday morning hours after the destruction of Orlando, warnings to take shelter and guard against fallout and radiation. There had been no milk deliveries and the telephones hadn't worked since the first mushrooms sprouted in the south, nor were there any actual shelters in Fort Repose. All Sunday, Randy insisted that Helen and the children stay in the house. He knew that any shelter, even a slate roof, insulation, walls, and roof, was better than none. There was no time to dig. The time to dig had been before the day. After Orlando, digging seemed wasted effort. Anyway, there were so many other things to do, each minor crisis demanding instant attention. When radiation was a danger, it could not be felt or seen, and therefore other dangers, and even annoyances, seemed more imperative. At 2 o'clock Monday afternoon, Helen was in Randy's apartment, and they were listening to the hourly Conalrad broadcast when Ben Franklin marched in and announced, "'We're just about out of water.' That's impossible, Randy said. It's Peyton's fault, said Ben Franklin. Every time she goes to the john, she has to flush it. The tub in our bathroom is empty, and she's been dipping water out of Mother's bathtub, too. Randy looked at Helen. This was a mother's problem. Peyton's a fastidious little girl, Helen said. After all, one of the first things a child learns to do is always flush the john. What are we going to do? Randy said, for now, Ben Franklin and I will drive down to the dock and fill up what wash tubs and buckets we have out of the river. You can't drink river water without boiling it, but it'll be okay for the toilets. And from now on, Peyton, all of us, can't afford to be so fastidious. We'll flush the toilets only twice a day. Then I guess we'll have to dig latrines out in the grove because I can't haul water from the river forever. Matter of gasoline. Randy looked out on the grove, noticing a thin powder of dust on the leaves. There had been a long dry spell. The fine, clear, crisp days with low humidity were wonderful for the people, but bad for the orange crop. He would have to turn on the sprinklers in the grove. He slammed his fist on the bar counter and shouted, I'm a damn fool. We've got all the water we want. Where? Helen asked. Right out there, Randy waved his arms. Artesian water, unlimited. But that's in the grove, isn't it? I'm sure we can pipe it into the house. After all, that's the same water the Henrys use every day. 
I think there are some big wrenches in the garage, and Malachi will know how to do it. Come on, Ben, let's go over to the Henrys. Randy and the boy walked down the old gravel and clay road that led from the garage through the grove and to the river. Randy's navels had been picked, but the Valencias were still on the trees. They would not be picked this year. Matching strides with Randy, Ben Franklin said, I just thought of something. Yes? I don't have to go to school anymore. What makes you think you don't have to go to school? As soon as things get back to normal, you're going to school, young feller. You want to grow up to be an ignoramus? Ben Franklin scuffed a pebble, looked up sideways at Randy, and grinned. What school? Why, the school in Fort Repose, of course, until you can go back to Omaha or wherever your father is stationed. Ben stopped. Just a minute, Randy. I'm not fooling myself. Nobody's going back to Omaha, maybe ever, and I don't think I'll ever see Dad again. The hole wasn't safe, you know. Maybe you think so. I know Mother does, but I'm not fooling myself, Randy, and don't you try to fool me. Randy put his hands on the boy's shoulders and looked into his face, measuring the depth of courage behind the brown eyes, finding it at least as deep as his own. Okay, son, he said, I'll level with you. I'll level with you, and don't you ever do anything less with me. I think Mark has had it. I think you're the man of the family from now on. That's what Dad said. Did he? Well, you're a man who still has to go to school. I don't know where or when or how, but as soon as the school reopens in Fort Repose or anywhere around, you go. You may have to walk. Golly, Randy, walk? It's three miles to town. Your grandfather used to walk to the school in Fort Repose. When he was your age, there weren't any school buses. When he couldn't hitch a ride in a buggy or on one of the early automobiles, he walked. Randy put his arm around the boy's shoulders. Let's get going. I guess we'll both have to learn to walk again. They walked down to the dock and then followed a trail that led to the dense hammock to the Henry's cleared land. The Henry's house was divided into four sections, representing four distinct periods in their fortunes and history. The oldest section had originally been a one-room log cabin. It was the only surviving structure of what had once been the slave quarters, and Randy recalled that his grandfather had always referred to the Henry's place as the quarters. In recent years, the cabin had been jacked up on a concrete foundation laid under the stout cypress logs. The logs, originally clinked with their red clay, were bound together with whitewashed mortar. It was now the Henry's living room. Late in the 19th century, a two-room pine shack had been added to the cabin. In the 20s, another room and a bath, and more soundly constructed, had been tacked on. In the 40s, after Two Tones' marriage to Missouri, the house had been enlarged by a bedroom and a new kitchen, built with concrete block. It was a comfortable hodgepodge, and its ugliness concealed under a patina of flame vine, bougainvillea, and hibiscus. A neat green bib of St. Augustine grass fell from the screened porch to the riverbank and dock. In the backyard, there was a chicken coop and wired runs, a pig pen, an ancient barn of unpainted cypress leaning warily against a scabrous chinaberry tree. The barn housed Balaam, the mule, the Model A, and a hutch of white rabbits. Fifty yards up the slope, Preacher Henry and Balaam solemnly disked the land, moving silently and evenly as if they perfectly understood each other. Caleb lay flat on his belly on the end of the dock, peering into the shadowed waters behind a piling, jigging a worm for bream. Two-Tone sat on the screened porch, rocking languidly and lifting a can of beer to his lips. From the kitchen came a woman's deep, rich voice singing a spiritual. That would be Missouri, washing the dishes. Hot, black smoke from a burning pine knot issued from both brick chimneys. It seemed a peaceful home, in a time of peace. Ben Franklin yelled, Hey, Caleb! Caleb's face bobbed up. Hi, Ben, he called. Come on out. What are you catching? I ain't catching, just jigging. Randy said, you can go on out to the dock if you want, Ben, but I'll probably need your help in a while. Ben looked up, surprised. Me? You'll need my help? Yep, Randy said, a man of the house has to do a man's work. Preacher Henry dropped his reins, yelled, ho, and Balaam stopped. Preacher walked across the dusty field to be planted in corn in February to meet Randy. Malachi came out of the barn. He had been under the Model A. Two-tone stopped rocking, put down his can of beer, and left the porch. Inside, Missouri stopped singing. Randy walked toward the back door, and the Henrys converged on him, their faces apprehensive. Malachi said, Hello, Mr. Randy. Hope everything's all right. About as right as they can be, considering. Everything okay here? Just like always. How's the little girl? Missouri told me she was about blinded. 
Peyton's better. She can now see, and in a few days she'll be allowed outside again. No permanent injury. The Lord be merciful, said Preacher Henry. The Lord has spared us from the now. I knew it was a coming, for it was all set down. Alas, Babylon! Preacher's eyes rolled upward. Preacher was big-framed, like Malachi, but now the muscles had shrunk around his bones, and age and troubles deeply wrinkled and darkened his face. Randy addressed his words to Preacher, because Preacher was the father and the head of the household. We don't have water in our house. I want to take up some pipe out of the grove and hook it to the artesian system. Yes, sir, Mr. Randy, I'll drop my disc in right now and help. No, you stick with the disking, Preacher. I thought maybe Malachi and Two-Tone could help. Two-Tone, who was called Two-Tone because the right side of his face was two shades lighter than the left, looked stricken. You mean now? Two-Tone said. Malachi grinned. You heard the man, Two-Tone. He means now. The three men, with Ben Franklin and Caleb helping, required two hours to lift the pipes and connect the artesian water line to the water system in the pump house. It was the hardest work Randy remembered since climbing and digging in Korea. The palm of his right hand was blistered from the pipe wrench and a swatch of skin flapped loose. He was exhausted and wet with sweat despite the chill of the evening. He was grateful when Malachi offered to carry the tools back to the garage. He said, thanks, Malachi. You know that 200 bucks I loaned you? Yes, sir. Just consider the debt canceled. They both grinned. Randy and Ben Franklin went back into the house. Randy turned on the tap in the kitchen sink. It gurgled, coughed, sputtered, and then spurted water. Isn't it beautiful, Helen said. Randy washed the grime from his hands, the water stinging the broken blisters. He filled a glass. The artesian water still smelled like rotten eggs. He gulped it. It tasted wonderful. Just after dawn, on the third day after the day, a helicopter floated over Fort Repose and then turned toward the upper reaches of the Tamuquan. Randy and Helen, hearing it, ran up to the captain's walk on the roof. It passed close overhead, and they distinguished the Air Force insignia. This was also the day of, di- this was also the day of disastrous overabundance. That morning, when Helen apprehensively opened the freezer, she found several hundred pounds of choice and carefully wrapped meat floating in a noxious sea of melted ice cream and liquefied butter. As any housewife would do under the circumstances, she wept. This disaster was perfectly predictable, Randy realized. He had been a fool. Instead of buying fresh meat, he should have bought canned meats by the case. If there was one thing he certainly should have foreseen, it was the loss of electricity. Even had Orlando escaped, the electricity would have died within a few weeks or months. Electricity was created by burning fuel oil in the Orlando plants. When the oil ran out, it could not be replenished during the chaos of war. There was no longer a rail system or rail centers, nor were tankers plying the coast on missions of civilian supply. It was Sam Hazard's guess that few major seaports had escaped. After the first wave of missiles from the submarines, they could still be taken out by atomic torpedoes, atomic mines, or bombs or missiles from aircraft. It was Sam Hazard's guess that what had been the great ports were now water-filled craters. Even those sections of the country which had escaped destruction entirely would not long have lights. Their power would only last as long as fuel stocks on hand. They stared into the freezer, Helen sniffing. Randy numb, Ben Franklin fascinated. Ben dipped his finger into a pool of liquid chocolate and licked it. Still tastes good, but it isn't even cool, he said. All that ice cream. I could have been eating ice cream all yesterday. Peyton, too. Helen stopped sniffling. The meat won't spoil for another 24 hours. I'm going to salvage what I can. How? Randy asked. Boil it, salt it, preserve it, pickle it. I've got a dozen mason jars in the closet. There may be some more around somewhere. Perhaps you can get some downtown, Randy. Town and back means half a gallon of gas, Randy said. It's worth it if you can find just a few, and we'll need more salt. Okay, I'll give it a try. Maybe I can find jars at the hardware store if Beck is still keeping it open. Helen reached into the freezer and lifted out two steaks, six pounders, two inches thick. She brought out two more steaks, even thicker. Steaks, steaks, steaks. Everywhere, steaks. How many steaks can Graf eat tonight? How does Graf like his steaks? Charcoal broiled? Graf, lying in the doorway between the kitchen and utility room, ears cocked and alert at the sound of his name, sniffed the wonderful odor of ripening meat in quantity.
He likes him and I like him, Randy said, and we've got a few sacks of charcoal in the garage. So let's have a party. A steak party to end all steak parties. Literally, that is. We'll have the Henrys and the McGoverns. I've always believed in mixing crowds at my parties, Helen said. But what about mixing colors? It'll be all right. I'll ask Florence Wedcheck and Alice Cooksey and Sam Hazard, too. And Dan Gunn, if I can find him. And I'll scrounge around for more charcoal. It'll be a relief from cooking in the fireplace. Don't forget the salt, Helen said. We're going to need a lot to save this meat. On this, the third day after the day, the character of Fort Repose had changed. Every building still stood, no brick had been displaced, yet all was altered, especially the people. Earlier, Randy had noticed that some of the plate glass store windows had cracked under the shock waves from Tampa and Orlando. Now the windows of a number of stores were shuttered entirely, and glass littered the sidewalks. From alleyways came the sour smell of uncollected garbage. Most of the parking spaces on Yulee and St. John's incongruously were occupied, but the cars themselves were empty, and several had been stripped of wheels. There was no commerce. There were few people. Altogether, Randy saw only four or five cars in motion. Those who were not out of gas hoarded what remained in their tanks against graver emergencies to come. The pedestrians he saw seemed apprehensive, hurrying along on missions private and vital, shoulders hunched, eyes directed dead ahead. There was no women on the streets, and the men did not walk in pairs, but alone and warily. Randy saw several acquaintances who must have recognized his car. Not one smiled or waved. Four young men, strangers, idled in front of the drugstore. The store's windows were broken, but Randy saw the grim, unhappy face of old man Hockstatler, the druggist, at the door. He was staring at the young men, and they were elaborately ignoring him. They were waiting for something, Randy felt. They were waiting like vultures. They were out waiting old man Hockstatler. Randy pulled into the parking lot alongside Ajax Supermarket. It appeared to be empty. The front door was closed and locked, but Randy stepped through a smashed window. The interior looked as if it had been stripped and looted. All that remained of the stock, he noticed immediately, were fixtures, dishes, and plastics on the home hardware shelves. Significantly, nobody had bothered to buy or take electric cords, fuses, or light bulbs. As for food, there seemed to be none left. Randy tried to remember where the salt counter had been. But salt was something one brought without thought, like razor blades or toothpaste, not bothering about it until it was needed. He thought about razor blades. He was low on them. Finally, he examined the guidance signs hanging over the empty shelves. He saw salt, flour, grits, sugar over a wall to his left. The space where these commodities should have been was bare. Not a single bag of salt remained. As Randy turned to leave, he heard a noise, wood scraping on concrete in the stock room in the rear of the store. He opened the stock room door and found himself looking into the muzzle of a small, shiny revolver. Behind the gun was the skinny, olive-colored face of Pete Hernandez. Pete lowered the gun and jammed it into a hip pocket. "'Geez, Randy,' he said. "'I thought it was some goddamn goon come back to clean out the rest of the joint. All I wanted was some salt.' "'Salt? You out of salt already?' No, we want to salt down some meat. We thought we could save part of the meat in the freezer. Randy saw a grocery truck drawn up to the loading platform behind the store. It was half filled with cases, and Pete had been pushing other cases down the ramp. So Pete had saved something. What happened here? Randy asked. We'd sold out of just about everything by closing time yesterday. When I tried to close up, they wouldn't leave. They wouldn't pay, neither. They started hollering and laughing and grabbing. I locked myself back in here, and that's how come I've got a little something left. Pete winked. Bet I can get some price for these canned beans in a couple of weeks. Randy sensed that Pete, perhaps because he had never had much of it, still coveted money. He said, I'll give you a price for salt right now. Pete's eyes flicked sideways. There was a cart in the corner. It was filled with sacks, sugar, and salt. Pete said, I've hardly got enough salt to keep things going at home. We're in the same boat as you are, you know. Freezer full of meat. Maybe Rita will be salting down meat, too. Randy brought out his wallet. Pete looked at it. Pete looked greedy. Randy said, What do you take for two ten-pound sacks of salt? I ain't got much salt left. I'll give you ten dollars a pound for salt. That's two hundred dollars. Being it's you, okay. Randy gave him four fifties. Pete felt the bills. 
Ten bucks a pound for salt, he said. Ain't that something? Randy cradled the sacks under each arm. Better go out the back way, Pete said. Don't tell nobody where you got it. And Randy? Yes. Rita wonders when you're coming to see her. She's all the time talking about you. When Rita latches on to a guy, she don't let go in a hurry. You know, Rita. Randy rejected the easy evasion of excuses. One of the things he hadn't liked about Rita was her possessiveness, and another was her brother. He was irritated because he had placed himself in the position of being forced to discuss personal matters with Pete. He said, Rita and I are through. That's not what Rita says. Rita says that other girl, that Yankee blonde, won't look so good to you now. Rita says this war is going to level people as well as cities. Randy knew it was purposeless to talk about Rita, or anything, with Pete Hernandez. He said, so long, Pete, and left the market. Beck's hardware was still open, and Mr. Beck, looking tired and bewildered, presided over rows of empty shelves. On the day itself, everything that could be immediately useful, from flashlights and batteries to candles and kerosene lanterns, had vanished. In the continuing buying panic, almost everything else had disappeared. Only reason I'm still here, Mr. Beck explained, is because I've been coming here every weekday for 22 years, and I don't know what else to do. In the warehouse, Beck found a dusty carton of mason jars. People don't go in much for home canning nowadays, Beck said. i just about forgotten these. How much? Randy asked. Beck shook his head. Nothing. That safe is full up to the top with money. That's all I've got left. Money. Ain't that funny? Nothing but money. Mr. Beck laughed. You know what? I could retire. Randy drove on to the medical arts building. Here he had expected to find activity. He found none, but he did see Dan Gunn's car in the parking lot. There were reddish-brown stains on the sidewalk and the concrete steps. The glass in the front door was shattered, and the door itself swung open. The waiting room was ominously empty. There was no one at the reception desk. Randy possessed a country dweller's keen sense of smell. Now he had smelled many alarming odors. Disinfectant, ether, spilled drugs, spilled blood, stale urine. He called, Dan! Hey, Dan! I'm back here. Who's that? Dan's voice emerged muffled after echoing through a corridor. It's me, Randy. Come on back. I'm in my office. In the corridor's gloom, Randy stumbled over a pair of feet, and he stepped back, shivering. A body lay athwart in the doorway of the examination room, legs in the corridor, torso in the room, face up, arms outstretched. The face was half blown away but when he put together with the uniform, it was recognizable as Cappy Foraker, for Pose's chief of police. Randy hurried on. A fireproof door hung crazily from hinge. It had been axed open. Behind the door was the laboratory and drug storage. The smell of chemicals that came from the laboratory was choking and overpowering. Within, Randy glimpsed a hillock of smashed jars and bottles. The clinic had been wrecked, insanely and deliberately. He was relieved to find Dan Gunn standing in his office. Dan's face was more deeply shadowed with fatigue and two-day growth of beard. His shirt was torn and he looked dirty, but he was apparently unhurt. Two medical bags were open on his desk. He was examining and sorting vials and bottles. Randy said, what happened? A carload of addicts, hopheads, came through last night, about three this morning, rather. Jim Bloomfield was here, sleeping on the couch in his office. We'd split up the duty. He took one night, I took the next. You see, with no phones, people don't know where else to go into a rush except the clinic in an emergency. Anyways, the addicts, and there were six of them, all armed, came in and woke Jim up. They wanted a fix. Poor old Jim was something of a Puritan. If he'd given them a fix, he might have gotten rid of them. Dan picked up a hypodermic syringe and slowly squeezed the plunger with his tremendous fingers. I'd have given him a fix all right. Three grains of morphine and that would have finished him. Dan dropped the syringe into one of the bags and shook his head. That probably wouldn't have been smart either. Three grains would kill a normal man, but it wouldn't even phase an addict. Anyway, Jim told them to go to hell. They beat him up. They emptied these bags and found what they were after. That wasn't enough. They took the fire axe and broke into the lab and drug storage. They cleaned us out of narcotics. Everything. Not only morphine, but all the barbiturates and sodium amytal and penthol and stimulants like benzodrine and dexedrine. What they didn't take, they smashed. What about Cappy Foraker? 
Randy asked. Same, some woman came in and heard the commotion and ran out and got Cappy. He was sleeping in the firehouse. Cappy and Bert Anders, you know, the kid assistant, came screaming over here. Literally screaming. They're with their siren going, the darn fools. The hopheads were set for them. There was a battle, more like a firefight, an ambush, I guess. Cappy got a shotgun load in the face. Anders got one in the belly. Cappy was dead when I got here about 15 minutes later. An old Doc Bloomfield? Randy asked. Dan swayed and rested his palms on the desk, his head bent. When he spoke, it was in a monotone. I drove Anders with Bloomfield to the hospital in San Marco. I couldn't operate here, you see, no anesthesia. Couldn't even sterilize my instruments. Everything septic. Young Anders was dead when I got there. Jim was still alive. I thought he was going to be all right. Beaten up, maybe a rib or two caved in, maybe concussion. Still, he was able to tell me quite coherently what had happened. Then he slipped away from me. I don't know why. He had lived a long time, and after this thing happened, maybe he didn't want to live any longer. Maybe he didn't want to belong to the human race anymore. He resigned. He died. Randy said, the bastards. Where'd they come from? Where'd they go? Dan Gunn shivered. The night had been chilly, and it had warmed only slightly during the day, and of course there was no heat in the building. He shook his head and slowly straightened, like a great storm-beset ship that had been wallowing in the trough of the sea, but would not founder. Where did they come from? He said, slipping on his coat. Maybe they broke out of a state hospital, but more likely they were hoods from St. Louis or Chicago driving to Miami or Tampa for the season. Probably they were addicts as well as pushers. The war caught them between sources of supply. So by last night, they were wild for junk, and the quickest way to get it was to detour to some little town like this and raid the clinic. As to where they're going, I don't care so long as it's far from here. Randy resolved never again to leave the house unless he was armed. You should carry a gun, Dan. I am from now on. Dan said, no. No, I'm not going to carry a gun. I've spent too many years learning how to save lives to start shooting people now. I'm not worried about punishment for the addicts. They carry a built-in torture chamber. Eventually, I'd say within a few weeks, no matter how many people they kill, they'll find no drugs. After this big jag, they're bound to have withdrawal sickness. They will die. Horribly, I hope. Dan closed the two bags. So ends the clinic in Fort Repose. Can you give me a lift to the hotel, Randy? I think my gas tank is dry. I'll take you to your hotel, only so you can pack, Randy said. On River Road, we've got food and good water and wood fireplaces. And the hotel, you don't have any of those things. He picked one of the bags. Now don't argue with me, Dan. Don't start talking about your duty. Without food and water and heat, you can't do anything. You can't even sterilize a scalpel. You won't have strength enough to take care of anybody. You can't even take care of yourself. When they entered the hotel, Randy smelled it at once. But not until they reached the second floor did he positively identify the odor. Like songs, odors are catalysts of memory. Smelling the odors of the Riverside Inn, Randy recalled the sickly, pungent stench of the honey carts with their loads of human manure for the fields of Korea. Randy spoke of this to Dan, and Dan said, I've tried to make them dig latrines in the garden. They won't do it. They have deluded themselves into believing that lights, water, maids, telephone, dining room service, and transportation will all come back in a day or two. Most of them have little hordes of canned foods, cookies, and candies. They eat it in their rooms alone. Every morning they wake up saying that things will be back to normal by nightfall, and every night they fall into bed thinking that normalcy will be restored by morning. It's been too big of a jolt for these poor people. They can't face reality. Dan had been talking as he packed. As they left the hotel, laden with bags and books, Randy said, What's going to happen to them? I don't know. They're bound to be a great deal of sickness. I can't prevent it because they won't pay attention to me. I can't stop an epidemic if it comes. I don't know what's going to happen to them. Dan moved into the house on River Road that day. Thereafter, he slept in the sleigh bed, the only bed in the house that could comfortably accommodate his frame in Randy's apartment, while Randy occupied the couch in the living room. That night afterwards was remembered as the night of the steak orgy. Yet it was not for the rich taste of meat, well hung, that Randy remembered the night. He and the Admiral and Bill McGovern cooked the steaks outside and then brought them into the living room. Fat wood burned in the big fireplace and a kettle steamed on hot bricks. 
At a few minutes before 10, Randy clicked on his transistor radio, and they all listened. Lib McGovern was sitting on the rug next to him, her shoulder touching his arm. The room was warm and comfortable and somehow safe. They heard the hum of a carrier wave, and then the voice of an announcer from the Clear Channel station somewhere deep in the heart of the country. This is your civil defense headquarters. I have an important announcement. Listen carefully. It will not be repeated again tonight. It will be repeated, circumstances permitting, at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Randy felt Lib's long fingers circle his forearm and grasp tight. Around the group before the fire, the faces were anxious. The white faces in the front row, the Negro faces, eyes white and large, behind. A preliminary aerial survey of the country has been completed. By order of the acting chief executive, Mrs. Van Bruker Brown, certain areas have been declared contaminated zones. It is forbidden for people to enter these zones. It is forbidden to bring any material of any kind, particularly metal or metal containers, out of these zones. Persons leaving the contaminated zones must first be examined at checkpoints now being established. The location of these checkpoints will be announced over your local Conorad stations. The contaminated zones are the New England states. Sam Hazard, sitting in a prim cherrywood rocker, which, like Sam, had originated in New England, drew in his breath. The newscaster continued. All of New York State south of the line Ticonderoga Sackets Harbor. The states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. The District of Columbia. Ohio east of the line Sandusky, Chillicothe. Also in Ohio, the city of Columbus and its suburbs. In Michigan, Detroit and Dearborn and an area of a 50-mile radius from these cities. Also in Michigan, the cities of Flint and Grand Rapids. In Virginia, the entire Potomac River Basin, the cities of Richmond and Norfolk and their suburbs. In South Carolina, the port of Charleston and all the territory within a 30-mile radius of Charleston. In Georgia, the cities of Atlanta, Savannah, Augusta and their suburbs. The state of Florida. Randy felt angry and insulted. He shifted his weight and started to get to his feet. Not the whole state, he said, at the same time realizing his protest was completely irrational. Shh, Lib said, and pulled him back to the rug. The voice went on, ticking off Mobile and Birmingham, New Orleans, and Lake Charles. It moved into Texas, obliterating Fort Worth and Dallas and everything within a 50-mile radius of these two cities, and Abilene, Houston, and Corpus Christi. It moved northward again. In Arkansas, Little Rock and its suburbs, plus an area of 40 miles to the west of Little Rock. Missouri, who through the whole evening had said nothing except an answer to questions, now said something. How come they hit Little Rock? The Admiral said there's a big SAC base in Little Rock, or was. The voice moved up to Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and then spoke of Chicago and everything around Chicago and northern Indiana, and crept up the western shore of Lake Michigan to Milwaukee and Milwaukee suburbs. Inexorably, it uttered the names of Kansas City, Wichita, and Topeka. The voice continued. In Nebraska, Lincoln. Also in Nebraska, Omaha, and all the territory within a 50-mile radius of Omaha. There goes all hope of Mark. Randy thought. More than one missile from Omaha, probably three, as Mark had expected. From the moment of the double dawn on the day, he had known it was probable. Now he must accept it as almost certain. He looked across the circle at three faces in the firelight. Peyton's face was half hidden against her mother's breast. Helen's face bent down and her arms were around Peyton's shoulders. Ben Franklin stared into the fire, his chin straight. Randy could see the tear path down Helen's face and the unshed tears in Ben's eyes. The announcement went on, the voice calling out portions of states and cities. Seattle, Hanford, San Francisco, all the Southern California coast, Helena, Cheyenne. But Randy only half heard them. All he could hear distinctly were the sharp sobs out of Peyton's throat. Randy's heart went out to them, but he said nothing. What was there to say? How do you say to a little girl that you are sorry she no longer has a father? Close to his side, Lib stirred and spoke, two words only, to Helen. I'm sorry. Randy had noticed that evening a tenseness between Helen and Lib, 
Nothing was said, and yet there was a watchfulness, a hostility between them. So he was glad that Lib had spoken. He wanted them to like each other. He was puzzled that they didn't. Then it was over. The radio stilled. More than ever, Randy felt cut off and isolated. Florida was a prohibited zone, and Fort Repose a tiny, isolated sector within that zone. He could appreciate why the whole state had been designated a contaminated area. There were so many bases, so many targets which had been hit with resulting contamination. They had been extraordinarily fortunate in Fort Repose. The wind had favored them. They had only received a residue of fallout from Tampa and Orlando, and none at all from Miami and Jacksonville. Only a reasonably clean weapon on Patrick could have rained radioactive particles on Fort Repose, but the enemy had not bothered to hit Patrick. Standing on the other side of the room, Preacher Henry had been listening, but he did not fully understand the designation of contaminated zones or comprehend the implications. He did feel and understand the shock and the grief the broadcast brought to the Braggs, and he sensed it was time for him to leave. He nudged Malachi, touched Two-Tone's rump with his toe, caught the attention of Hannah and Missouri, and he said with dignity, We be going now. I thank you, Mr. Randy, for a real fine steak dinner. I hope we can sometime repay it. Randy rose to his feet and said, Good night, preacher. It was good to have you all. On the fourth day after the day, Randy, Malachi, and Two-Tone extended the artesian water system to the houses of Admiral Hazard and Florence Wechek. Stretching pipe across the grove to the Admiral's house was simple, but to provide water for Florence Wechek and Alex Cooksey, it was necessary to dig through the macadam of River Road with picks. On the night of the sixth day, the Riverside Inn burned. With no water in the hydrants and the hotel's sprinkler system inoperative, the fire department was all but helpless. Only a few reserve firemen showed up, and only one pumper was got into action using river water. It was a puny effort, and far too late. The old, resinous wooden structure was burning brightly before the first stream touched the walls. Soon the heat drove the firemen away. A few minutes thereafter, the last scream was heard from the third floor. Dan had been summoned an hour later, and Randy had driven him into town. By then, there was nothing to do except care for the survivors. They were few. Some of these died of smoke, poisoning, or fear. It was hard to diagnose within a few hours. The burned were taken to San Marco and Bubba Offenhouse's hearse ambulances. The uninjured were lodged in the Fort Repose School. There was no heat in the school or food or water. It was simply shelter, less comfortable than the hotel, and within a few days, more squalid. Dan Gunn suspected that the fire had started in a room where the guests were using canned heat in an attempt to boil water. Or perhaps someone had built a makeshift wood stove. It was, Dan said, inevitable. On the ninth day after the day, Lavinia McGovern died. This, too, had been inevitable ever since the lights went out and refrigeration ceased. Since Lavinia McGovern suffered from diabetes, insulin had kept her alive. Without refrigeration, insulin deteriorated rapidly. Not only Lavinia, but all diabetics in Fort Repose, dependent on insulin, died at about the same time period as the drug lost its potency. Randy and Dan had done their best to save her. They had driven to San Marco hoping to find refrigerated insulin or the new oral drug at the hospital. It was 18 miles to San Marco. Even driving at the most economical speed in his heavily horsepowered car, Randy estimated that the trip would consume three gallons of gasoline. He estimated he only had five gallons remaining in his tank, and plus a five-gallon can in reserve. Randy made a difficult decision. By then, the Bragg home was linked to the houses of Admiral Hazard, Florence Wedcheck, and the Henrys, not only by an arterial system of pipes fed by nature's pressure, but also by other common needs. The Henry's Model A was neither beautiful nor comfortable, but its engine was twice as thrifty as Randy's rakish sports hardtop. Sam Hazard's car gulped gasoline as fast as Randy's. Dan's was empty. The Model A was an even more economical than Florence's old Chevy. Randy decided that henceforth the Model A would furnish community transportation. So it was in the Model A that Randy and Dan made the trip to San Marco. The trip was a failure.
the hospital no longer possessed insulin or substitutes for insulin. Like the pharmacies, the hospital had purchased its supplies in small quantities and was dependent on weekly or bi-weekly deliveries from jobbers in the large cities. Its insulin had already gone to meet the demand in its own community. Further, the hospital's auxiliary generator was operated only during the evening hours for emergency operations and for a few minutes at each hour on the hour to supply power for WSMF. It was necessary to conserve fuel, and unless the generator ran continuously, it was inadequate for refrigeration. Bouncing back to Fort Repose in the Model A, Dan grumbled, the place we should have built up stockpiles was out in the country, like Tamukawan County. Stockpiles weren't going to be much of use in the cities because after the day, there weren't going to be any cities left. But where were the stockpiles? In the cities, of course. It was easier. So Lavinia McGovern, after 48 hours in a coma, died. Alice Cooksey was at her bedside after midnight on the ninth day when Lavinia died. Lavinia's husband and daughter, both exhausted from the effort to keep the house in some sort of order, slept. Alice did not awaken them, or anybody, until morning. She kept vigil alone, dozing on a chaise. Nothing could help Lavinia, but everybody needed sleep. Alice brought the news to the Bragg house in the morning. A fire blazed in the dining room, which smelled pleasantly of bacon and coffee. Randy, Helen, the children, and Dan Gunn were at breakfast. A breakfast exactly like one they would have eaten ten days before, with one important exception. There was orange juice, freshly squeezed, fresh eggs from the Henry's yard, bacon, coffee. There was no toast because there was no bread. Randy already was beginning to miss bread, and he wondered why he had not thought to buy flour. By the time Helen had put flour on their list, the shelves were bare of it. He suspected that the older housewives of Fort Repose, remembering a time when people baked their own bread instead of buying it packaged, sliced, with vitamins re-injected, had cleaned the stores out of flour on the day. He resolved, when he could, to trade for flour. It would be June before they could look forward to cornbread from Preacher Henry's crop. Alice had bicycled from the McGovern house. Before she closed the Western Union office, Florence Wechek had salvaged the messenger's bicycle. It was a valuable possession. Now that all their remaining gasoline was pooled to operate one car, the bicycle was primary transportation for Alice and Florence. Alice was, for the first time in her life, dressed in slacks, a necessity for bicycling. She accepted coffee and told of Lavinia's death. Bill McGovern and Elizabeth, she said, were taking it well, but they didn't know what to do with the body. They needed help with the burial. I'll go see Bubba Offenhouse right away, Dan said, and try to arrange her burial. I've got to talk to Bubba anyways. I can't seem to impress upon him the importance of burying the dead as quickly as possible. He suddenly seems to hate his profession. That's not like Bubba, Alice Cooksey said. Bubba always bragged that he was the most efficient undertaker in Florida. He used to say, when the retired started coming to Fort Repose, they found a mortuary with all modern conveniences. That's the trouble, Dan said. Bubba abhors unorthodox funerals. He almost wept when I insisted that the poor devils who died in the fire be buried at once in a single grave. We had to use a bulldozer, you know. Bubba claims Repose and Peace Park is ruined for good. Randy had been silent since Alice brought the news. Now he spoke as if he had been holding silent debate with himself, and he finally had reached a conclusion. They'll have to live here. Helen set down her coffee cup. Who will have to live here? We'll have to ask Lib and Bill McGovern to stay with us. But we don't have room, and how will we feed them? Randy was puzzled and disturbed. He had never thought of Helen as a selfish woman, and yet obviously she didn't want the McGoverns. We really have plenty of room, he said. There's still an empty bedroom upstairs. Bill can have it, and Lib can sleep with you. With me? He could see that Helen was angry. Well, you have twin beds in your room, Helen, but if you seriously object, Bill can sleep in my apartment, there's an extra couch, and Lib can have the room. After all, it's your house, Helen said. As a matter of fact, Helen, the house is half Mark's, which makes it half yours, so the decision is yours as well as mine. Lib and Bill have no water and no heat and not much food left because almost all their food reserve was in their freezer. They don't even have a fireplace. They've been cooking and boiling water on a charcoal grill in the Florida room. Helen shrugged and said, Well, I guess you'll have to ask them. 
Elizabeth could sleep with me, but I hope it isn't a permanent arrangement. After all, our food supply is limited. It is limited, Randy said, and it's going to get worse. Whether the McGoverns are here or not, we're all going to have to scrounge for food pretty quick. Dan rose and said, I better get going. Randy followed him. He had cultivated the habit of leaving his forty-five automatic on the hall table and pocketing it as he left the house, as a man would put on his hat. Since he never wore a hat and never had before carried a gun, except in the army, he still had to make a conscious effort to remember. When they were in the car, Randy said, That was a strange way for Helen to behave. Don't know what's eating her. Not strange at all, Dan said. Just human. She's jealous. That's ridiculous. No, Helen is fiercely protective. No, Helen is a fiercely protective woman, protective of her children. With Mark gone, you and the house are her security and the children's security. She doesn't want to share you and your protection. Matter of self-preservation, not infatuation. I see, Randy said, or at least I think I see. They drove up to the front of the McGovern house. Randy said, it's pointless for both of us to go in. Nothing you can do here. While you go get Bubba off in house, I'll tell them they're going to move in and get them going. Right, Dan said. Economy of effort and forces. Always a good rule of war. Randy walked into the house, wondering a bit at himself. Without being conscious of it, he had begun to give orders in the past few days. Even to the admiral, he had given orders. He had assumed leadership in the tiny community bound together by the water pipes leading from the artesian well. Since no one had seemed to resent it, he guessed it had been the proper thing to do. It was like... Well, it wasn't the same, but it was something like commanding a platoon. When you had the responsibility, you also had the right to command. The McGovern house was damp and it was chilly. It retained the cold of night. Lib, wearing corduroy jodhpurs and a heavy blue turtleneck sweater, greeted him at the door. She said, I heard the jalopy and I knew it was you. Thanks for coming, Randy. She held out her hands to him and he kissed her. Her hands felt cold, and when he looked down at them, he saw that her fingernails, always so carefully kept, were broken and crusted with dirt. Still, she was dry-eyed and calm. Whatever tears she had had for her mother were already shed. Randy said, Alice told us. We're all terribly sorry, darling. He knew it sounded insincere, and it was. With so many dead, so many friends for whom he had as yet not had time even for thought, the death of one woman whom he did not admire overmuch and with whom he had never been and could not be close, was a triviality. With perhaps half the country's population dead, death itself, unless it took someone close and dear, was trivial. She said, come in and talk to Dad. He's worried about how we're going to bury her. We're arranging that, Randy said, and followed her into the house. Bill McGovern sat in the living room, staring out onto the river. He had not bothered to dress or shave. Over his pajamas and robe, he had pulled a top coat. Randy turned to Lib. Have either of you had any breakfast? She shook her head. No. Bill spoke without turning his head. Hello, Randy. I'm not much of a success, am I, in a time of crisis? I can't feed my daughter or myself or even bury my wife. I wish I had enough guts to swim out into the channel and sink. That can't help Lavinia, and it wouldn't help Elizabeth or anybody. You and Lib are going to live with me. Things will be better. Randy, I'm not going to impose myself on you. I might as well face it. I'm finished. You know I'm over 60. And do you know what the worst thing is? Central tool and plate. I spent my whole life building it up. What is it now? Chances are, just a mess of twisted and burned metal. Junk. So there goes my life, and what good am I? I can't start over. Central tool and plate is junk and I'm junk. Randy stepped over and stood between Bill and the cracked window so as to look into his face. You might as well stop feeling sorry for yourself, he said. You're going to have to start over. Either that or die. You have to face it. Lib touched her father's shoulder. Come on, Dad. Bill didn't move or reply. Randy felt anger inside him. You want to know what good you are? That means what good you are to somebody else, not to yourself, doesn't it? If you're no good to anybody else, I'd guess you'd better go take that long swim. You know something about machinery, don't you? 
McGovern pushed himself in his chair. I know about as much about machine tools as any man in America. I didn't say machine tools. I said machinery, batteries, gasoline engines, simple stuff like that. I didn't start at Central Tool and Plate as president or board chairman. I started in the shop, working with my hands. Sure, I know about machinery. That's fine. You can help Malachi and Admiral Hazard. We've taken the batteries out of my car and the Admiral's car and hooked them onto the Admiral's shortwave set so we can find out what cooks around the world. Only it doesn't work right. Something's wrong with the circuit and the batteries are fading and I don't know how we can charge them. Very simple, Bill said. Power take off from the Model A. It'll work so long as you have gas. Fine, Randy said. That's your first job, Bill, helping Malachi. Malachi? Isn't he the brother of our cleaning woman, Missouri, your yard man? That's him, first class mechanic. Bill McGovern smiled. So I'll be mechanic second class? That's right. Bill rose. All right, it's a deal. I'll dress and then he stopped. Oh Lord, I forgot. Poor Lavinia. Randy, what am I going to do about her? He hesitated as if the word were crude, but he could find no other body. We're attending to that, Randy said. Dan Gunn has gone up to get Bubba Offenhouse. I hope Bubba will handle the burial. Meanwhile, I think you and Lib better start packing. We may have to make three or four trips, I guess. How much gas have you got in your car? Lib said a couple of gallons, I think. That'll be enough to make the move, and you won't need the car after that. We can use the battery for Sam Hazard's shortwave set. While they packed, Randy prowled the house searching for useful items. In a kitchen cupboard, he discovered an old, pitted iron pot of tremendous capacity and, forgetting the presence of death in the house, whooped with delight. Lib raced into the kitchen, demanding a reason for the shouting. He hefted the pot. "'I'll bet it'll hold two gallons,' he said. "'What a find!' "'It's just an old pot Mother bought when we were in New England one summer. "'An antique. She thought it would look wonderful with a plant. "'It looked awful.' It'll look beautiful hanging in the dining room fireplace, Randy said, filled with stew. The old pot was the most useful object. Indeed, it was one of the few useful objects he found in the McGovern house. Twenty minutes later, Dan Gunn returned, alone and worried. Bubba Offenhouse, he said, can't help us. Bubba would like to bury himself. He's got dysentery, running at both ends. He and Kitty were certain it was radiation poisoning. Symptoms are pretty much alike, you know. Both of them were in a panic. He'll get over it in a few days, but that's not helping us now. Randy said, so what do we do? Dan looked at Bill McGovern, fully dressed now, but still unwashed and unshaven, for there was no water in the house except a jug for drinking. That Randy had brought to them, Dan looked at Bill McGovern, fully dressed now, but still unwashed and unshaven, for there was no water in the house except for a jug for drinking that Randy had brought to them the day before. Dan said, I think that's up to you to decide, Bill. What is there to decide? Bill asked. Whether to bury your wife here or in the cemetery. You don't have a plot in Repose in Peace, but I'm sure Bubba won't mind. Anyway, there's nothing he can do about it, and you can settle with him later. Bill McGovern turned to his daughter. What do you say, Elizabeth? Well, of course, I think Mother deserves a proper funeral in a cemetery. It seems like the least we can do for her, and yet... She turned to Randy. You don't agree, do you, Randy? Randy was glad that she had asked. Intervening in this private and personal matter was brutal, but necessary. No, I... I don't agree. It's six miles to the cemetery. We'd have to make the trip in two cars because of the... because of Lavinia. That's 24 miles worth of gasoline round trip, and we can't afford it. We'll have to bury Lavinia here on the grounds. But how, Lib began, where do you keep the shovels, Bill? There's a tool shed in the back of the garage. While handing a shovel to Dan and selecting one for himself, Randy examined the other tools. There was a new axe. It would be very useful. There were pitchforks, edgers, a scythe, and a wheelbarrow. He would bring Malachi over before dark, and they would divvy up the McGovern tools. In everything he did now, he found he looked into the needs of the future. Between house and river, a crescent-shaped azalea bed flanked the west border of the McGovern property. The bitter blue grass had been carefully tended, and the bed was shaded from afternoon's hot sun by a live oak older than Fort Repose. Looking around, Randy could find no spot more suitable for a grave. 
He stepped six feet and marked a rectangle within the crescent. He and Dan began to dig. After a few minutes, Randy removed his sweater. This was no easy job. Dan stopped and inspected his palms. He said, I'm getting ditch jiggers hands. Very bad for a surgeon. They continued to dig steadily until it was awkward working from the surface. Randy stepped into the deepening grave. They had made a discovery. A grave designed to accommodate one person must be dug by one person alone. When Randy paused, winded, Bill McGovern stepped down and took the shovel, saying, I'll spell you. From above, Lib watched. Presently, she said, that's enough for you, Dad. Remember the blood pressure. I don't want to lose you, too. She stepped into the hole and relieved him of the shovel. After he climbed out, panting and white-faced, she thrust the shovel savagely into the sand. As she dug, her stature increased in Randy's eyes. She was like a fine sword, slender and flexible, but steel, a woman of courage. It was not gentlemanly, but Randy allowed her to dig, recognizing the physical effort was an outlet for her emotions. When her pace slowed and he dropped into the hole and took the shovel. That's enough. Dan and I will finish. You and your father had better go back to the house and get on with your packing. You don't want us to help you carry her out, do you? I think it would be better if you didn't. Dan reached down and lifted her out of the hole. When the grave was finished, they wrapped Lavinia's emaciated body in her bed sheets. Her coffin was an electric blanket and her hearse a wheelbarrow. They lowered her into the five-foot hole and packed in the sand and loam afterwards, leaving an insignificant mound. Randy knew that when spring came, the mound would flatten with the rains, the grass would swiftly cover it, and by June, it would have disappeared entirely. Randy called the McGoverns. There was no service, no spoken word. They all stood silent for a moment, and then Bill McGovern said, We don't even have a wooden marker for her, or a sliver of stone, do we? We could take something out of the house, Randy suggested, a statue or a vase or something. It isn't necessary, Lib said. The house is my mother's monument. This was, of course, true. They turned from the grave and back to their work. That evening, Bill McGovern, with some eagerness, walked to the Henry's house and talked to Malachi. Together, they went along the riverbank to Sam Hazard's house and conferred with him on a plan for supplying power for the Admiral's shortwave receiver. Dan Gunn drove to Fort Repose to visit the homeless, some of them sick or burned, lodged in the school. Randy and Lib McGovern sat alone on the front porch steps, Lib's elbows on her knees, her chin supported by her hands, Randy's arms encircling her shoulders. She was speaking of her mother. I'm sure she never really comprehended what happened on the day, or ever could. Perhaps I am only rationalizing, but I think her death was an act of mercy. Randy heard someone running up the driveway, and then he saw the figure and recognized Ben Franklin. Ben, he called, what's the matter? Ben stopped out of breath and said, something's happened at Miss Wetchek's. Randy rose, ready to get his pistol. What happened? I don't know. I was just walking by her house and I heard somebody scream. I think Miss Wetchek. Then I heard her crying. Randy said, we'd better go take a look, Lib. You stay here, Ben. Yellow candlelight shone from Florence's kitchen. They went to the back door. Florence was wailing and Randy entered without bothering to knock. As he opened the screen door, green and yellow feathers fluttered around his feet. Florence's head rested on her arms on the kitchen table. She was dressed in a quilted, rose-hued robe. Alice Cooksey was with her, coaxing water to boil on a sterno kit. Randy said, What seems to be the trouble? Florence raised her head. Her untidy pink hair was moist and stringy. Her eyes were swollen. Sir Percy ate Anthony, she said. She began to sob. She's had a terrible day, said Alice Cooksey. I'm trying to make tea. She'll feel better after she's had tea. What all happened? Randy asked. It really began yesterday, Alice said. When we woke up yesterday morning, the angelfish were dead. You know how cold it was the night before last, and of course, without electricity, there's no heat for the aquarium. And this morning, all the mollies and neons were dead. As a matter of fact, nothing's alive in the tank except the miniature catfish and a few guppies. And then this evening, Sir Percy, Florence interrupted, a murderer. Hush, dear, Alice said. The water will be boiling in a moment. She turned to Randy. Florence really shouldn't blame Sir Percy. After all, there's been no milk for him and very little of anything else. 
As a matter of fact, we haven't seen Sir Percy in three or four days. I suppose he was out hunting for himself. But a few minutes ago, when Anthony flew home, Sir Percy was on the porch. Ambushed poor Anthony, Florence said. Actually ambushed him, killed him and ate him right there on the porch. Poor Cleo. Where's Sir Percy now? Randy asked. He's gone again, Alice said, and he better not come back. Randy was thoughtful. Hunting cats would be a problem. And what would happen to dogs? He still had a few cans of dog food for Graf, but he could foresee a time when humans might look upon dog food as a delicacy. He said aloud, but speaking to himself rather than the others, Survival of the fittest. What do you mean? Lib said. The strong survive. The frail die. The exotic fish die because the aquarium isn't heated. The common guppy lives, so does the tough catfish. The house cat turns hunter and eats the pet bird. If he didn't, he'd starve. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be. Florence had stopped crying. You mean, with humans? You mean we humans are going to have to turn savage, like Sir Percy? Well, I can't do it. I don't want to live in that kind of a world, Randy. You'll live, Florence, Randy said. Walking back to his own house, Randy said, Florence is a guppy, a nice, drab little guppy. That's why she'll survive. What about you and me, Lib said. We're going to have to be tough. We're going to have to be catfish. <laughs>